Hi everyone, my name is Brian White and I teach biology in the School of STEM. I want to thank Dr. Um, Apple for inviting me to come and speak with you and I want to thank you for taking the time to um, have us explore stress and depression. So here we have to the left a picture of a lion chasing after a zebra. This is kind of indicative of the fight or flight response, the acute stress response. And then down here, I have a picture of um, uh, what I used to think about BDNF. It's a substance that is secreted in the brain. And I think of this as nourishment for neurons and how BDNF might uh, protect and help change the course of uh, depression. So what we're going to talk about are some effects of the stress response and then the effect of long-term cortisol, which is a stress hormone on depression. And we see up here uh, is a graph charting the amount of cortisol in the blood on the y-axis and the time of day on the x-axis and we see that a stressed individual um, has a lot more cortisol coursing through their bloodstream than an unstressed individual. We're gonna look at BDNF, this nourishment for neurons and its role in depression. And lastly, we're gonna talk about ketamine, um, a drug that has been found to be quick acting to help reduce uh, depressive symptoms. So, Dr. Apple uh, is only giving me a short time to talk with you. I suggest if you have extra time, um, here is a short video on the stress response in our bodies, both the acute stress response and the effects of long-term stress on our body. Uh, it's done by Robert Sapolsky, um, he's an expert with stress and stress hormones, and um, I think it's a fun video. The other video that I um, suggest you look at, at least the first part of it, is, talking, um, is this one, where Dr. McGonagall will uh, give a new look at stress hormones and stress. And... I was brought up thinking that stress and long-term stress is always bad. Um, but what uh, Dr. McGonagall talks about is a long-term study where, yes, people that experienced long-term stress were more likely to die. But it actually was only the people that viewed stress as a bad thing that actually had the increase of dying. And the people that viewed stress as not bad for their body did not have um, the, the same chance or increased risk of dying. And so it kind of flips how we view stress, that like stress before an exam is preparing our body to, to ace the exam. So here's some uh, uh, videos on stress. Um, that I would encourage you to look at. Now, in the Sp Sapolsky video, we kind of learn about the stress response. And part of it is this fight or flight response where your body is um, immediately uh, shunting blood to muscles, increasing blood pressure, increasing oxygen and glucose, so blood sugar, all for the purposes of running away, kind of running after a saber-toothed tiger or if, uh, or running toward, if you're a predator, running toward your prey. And uh, in addition to turning on all these things, kind of it stops the rest and digest functions in our bodies. So uh, it, in a stress response, we reduce our digestion, we uh, reduce reproduction. Uh, and uh, Sapolsky has a line where it says, when you're running away from a tiger, 
who needs to ovulate. That that's kind of a um, uh, he says that in a flippant way, but it it might help people remember. And you also um, might have experience people that have long term stress might be more apt to get sick. So uh, these are the things that a stress response will slow. And the stress response is mediated by two signals. One is epinephrine or uh, adrenaline. You, you, I, many of you have heard of adrenaline. You also might have heard of epinephrine or people that carry an EpiPen uh, to stop anaphylactic shock. And that might make sense because uh, it, it, uh, epinephrine would bronchodilate, so open the airways and increase respiration and increase blood pressure. Um, that's, and then cortisol is another stress hormone. Um, and I kind of use cortisol and glucocorticoids interchangeably. Uh, cortisol is a certain type of glucocorticoid, um, and it mediates both a short-term stress response and a long-term stress response. So I mentioned this uh, graph earlier, and uh, it has some interesting take-home points. One thing we see is over the course of a day, the amount of cortisol fluctuates in our blood. And cortisol is essential for you know, keeping our blood pressure up uh, and um, preparing us for activities throughout the day. But in long-term stress individuals, their cortisol level can be high, higher at all points of the day. And, and so one might wonder, what does the increased cortisol levels and stress hormones do to those individuals? And how might that play a role in depression? So, increased cortisol or stress hormones does cause depression-like behaviors in monkeys. So I'm gonna show you uh, two graphs to help uh, visualize that point. And on the one on the left, the y-axis is looking at how many times an hour a monkey would huddle, which for a monkey is a depression-like behavior. And uh, we have pre-treatment and post-treatment. And the treatment is giving either a glucocorticoid or a stress hormone or giving kind of a placebo, like water. And we see initially uh, the monkeys don't huddle very often, but if they're given glucocorticoids or if they're given stress hormones for seven days, they end up um, having this huddling behavior more than if they were not given cortisol. And the, the graph on, in the middle now says not only do they, the frequency of huddling occur more often, but when they do, they huddle and crouch down for a longer period of time. And finally, another readout of a depressed-like state is how often a monkey or a rat will drink sugar water. So normally they will pick sugar water over regular water. Uh, sugar water is, um, you know, gives a sense of the reward uh, and, and maybe pleasure. Um, and so we see initially uh, 60, they end up drinking um, 60, I guess, milligrams per kilogram of their body weight uh, uh, of sugar water. But if they're given a stress hormone for seven days, they drink less. 
And uh, this is a, a signal of, I think it's called anhedonia, so the absence of pleasure, which is a hallmark of uh, a depressive um, disorder. So things that used to give pleasure no longer do. And um, here's a, a legend for these um, graphs. So the take home is if you have a lot of stress hormones for a long period of time, it can increase depression-like behaviors in monkeys. Now, the, the, in addition to cortisol, I want to spend a lot of time talking about Oh no, um, talking about uh, BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor. And you don't need to know the name, but it's nutrition or nourishment for neurons. And it, it makes the neurons uh, happy. It will protect neurons from dying. And then it increases neurogenesis. So this means the birth of new neurons. So if there's lots of BDNF, there are a couple places in the brain, one being the hippocampus, where new neurons are born throughout life. And then finally, it increases um, the, the um, interactions between two different neurons, and it increases kind of the connections between neurons. Now, what do those things do for us is it can increase um, brain plasticity. So that means increase the ability of our brain to make different connections and learn. Uh, it can reduce depression and um, depression symptoms. And it uh, can help with um, increasing memory. So BDNF is super good. And so you might be wondering, how do we get more BDNF? And there, um, often when we think about trying to be healthy, we might think about, oh, I want to exercise more, or I should sleep more. Maybe I should calm my brain and meditate, or uh, to be, spend more time in the sun to kind of buoy my mood. And all four of these activities are found to increase our body's secretion of BDNF. Increase this thing that's really good for neurons and, and good for neurons being born. So, what are now, if we think of the depressed state, what might happen to BDNF or or are they correlated? And so in depression, an area of the brain called the hippocampus uh, secretes less BDNF. So there's less kind of protection and, and happiness for neurons. The other kind of example I want to give is uh, this was a study studying 20 um, uh, women that were depressed and 20 women that were healthy and they were given um, antidepressants. And so first, uh, what I'm showing here is they measured the level of BDNF and in the, um, in the depressed women, that level was 22. After they got antibiotics, um, antidepressive therapy, it went up uh, to 30, let's say 36, and it got closer to the level of, of the healthy controlled um, subjects. And so there's a correlation here where they're in depressed, in this study, in depressed women, they had less BDNF compared to um, when they got better and compared to um, healthy uh, control comparison. And so uh, here is looking at some graphs from that uh, study. On the y-axis is the level of BDNF, and on the x-axis here are all the different individuals. 
and the boxes is the level of BDNF initially, and after treatment, the, the kind of arrow shows the level of BDNF um, after treatment. So here's before treatment and after treatment. And the um, median and mean uh, values are here, but now we see some individuals really had a big difference, whereas some individuals not so much. So more BDNF um, is uh, expressed after antidepressive treatment. And then uh, what happens, in, did, did the antidepressive treatment work? And so they also measured the Hamilton depression score, and we see initially uh, it, the individuals scored higher, and then after treatment they uh, scored lower, and so the treatment was working, and there was a correlation between um, the treatment working and the amount of BDNF that uh, it was in uh, their blood. Now, how might these stress hormones interact with BDNF? And so here's uh, one figure where this was a study looking at BDNF expression, and they gave cells either kind of a, a placebo or water, and they gave other cells a, a hormone that is like a steroid, uh, cortisol. And we see that the cells that got the, the stress hormone um, had less BDNF. So here it looks like BDNF is depressed by glucocorticoids. And again, BDNF was this nourishment for neurons. And then in a, another study, they looked at different brain regions and how much uh, the level of BDNF in depression versus after an antidepressant was given. And if we just, uh, we can see that um, it has different roles, but if we look at the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex, uh, two regions that are often affected in depression. Um, in depression, there's less BDNF there. And with antidepressant treatment, there ends up being more BDNF expressed. So again, here's this uh, correlation between uh, a BDNF glucocorticoids or stress hormones and depression. So one thing that I want to share, earlier I said that this nourishment for neurons had an effect for uh, how many connections neurons had with each other. And here's a, a cartoon of a neuron, and neurons have one area that can listen to other neurons, and they're called dendrites, and we kind of see them here. These are all part of the neuron that can listen. And what this is showing is BDNF can be in two forms. And one of the forms makes lots of BDNF and has lots of dendrites. It can listen really well. Whereas another form of BDNF um, does not make as many connections. And this form of BDNF ha gives a higher risk for depression. And so, uh, you know, the, is there some um, correlation between how well certain neurons are listening and depression? And the um, that leads us to um, a study where we're looking at the dendrites or the part of the neuron that listens to other neurons and what happens to it that during stress. And so you can take mice and give them a stressor, 
which is just kind of restraining them for 30 minutes per day for seven days. And we can see neuron shape that goes from these dendrites where there's lots of them and can listen and dendrites that cannot, or maybe not cannot listen, but there are less of them listening. And what does that do? Um, oh, So, you might have heard about ketamine. And this is arguably maybe the one of the most important discoveries for a treatment for depression. Normal treatments for depression, uh, like uh, having a um, increasing serotonin, uh, will take you know six weeks to eight weeks to have an effect, whereas ketamine can have an effect in hours. And so um, I just want to mention it and and wrap it in with the dendrite information that I was just showing you. So stress will cause dendrites to become less and have them make less connections. So uh, this is zooming in on one of those dendrites that can listen to other cells. And um, on the one on the right, it has stress and they're fewer and smaller. And then what's shown down here 5-HT um, is serotonin, and in a control neuron or control mouse, there's lots of serotonin signaling going on, but in a stressed out mouse in the prefrontal cortex, serotonin signaling has dropped. And yet, you give one day of ketamine, and it increases the number of connections between neurons, and uh, serotonin signaling skyrockets in just one day. So in, in mice, we can see um, some of this data is graphed. So uh, CUS is that chronic uncontrolled stress that, that restraining them for seven days. And so you can see the number of spines or connections on the dendrite goes down, but you give ketamine, a day later it's back up. You can does that affect the behavior of the mouse? Again, looking at, will it go to sucrose? Will it go to something that gave it pleasure before? And if you stress the mouse out, it won't. But if you give it ketamine, it, it goes back to how it was behaving earlier. And um, one other uh, readout or, or way to quantify stress in a mouse is... Um, will it go and eat? Um, or is it scared and stressed out and will hang out by the edge of the, um, let's say, cage? And so it, it doesn't eat. There's latency. Uh, you know, it, it, it'll take five minutes for it to venture out and eat. But if you give ketamine a day later, um, it acts normally. And what... Um, Ketamine increases the synapses between neurons. And you might remember that BDNF does the same thing. So, take-home messages from today. Thank you for letting me talk at you. Is uh, Cortisol is secreted during a stress response. Uh, this helps us in the short term if we're running away from a, a, a saber-toothed tiger. But if it's a long-term stress response where we don't shut off our stress response, they can reduce BDNF. And one thing I didn't tell you, uh, in about 50% of depressed patients have high levels of cortisol. And um, you might see someone that's depressed as someone that's lethargic, can't get out of bed, um, hard to um, uh, turn in homework or complete activities. And yet, they actually have a raging stress response going on in their body. 
just like the acute one to run away from a saber-toothed tiger, but now it is long-term. And one of the um, unfortunate events of that is it reduces BDNF. And so doing things that can increase BDNF may decrease depression or reduce the chance of depressive symptoms. So there, there continues to be studies in this uh, way. And the way you can increase BDNF is by uh, running, sleeping, being in the sun, and meditating. And so when